Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast, which delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. You are joining us for episode 303, Rethinking Education and Conscious Parenting with Matt Boudreaux. Today's episode is going to cover ways to empower your child or teen, as well as considerations in how to foster creativity, strength of character, confidence, and just becoming you know, a valued member of society versus falling into the trap of institutionalized learning. Yes, nothing like the bad season to bring to light the dangers of groupthink and dumbing down a society and removing the importance of discourse and questioning the narrative. So today's episode is going to be a good one, whether you are a parent or considering becoming a parent or a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, or literally any member of our community and society because we know that what we invest into our children's and teens truly Really does shape our future. And a lot of the issues that we're seeing ourselves going towards at this time is likely influenced by the impact of institutionalized learning and kind of dumbing down critical thinking and getting into that uh, multiple box or circle in, as you talked about, fill in that circle mm-hmm. type in thought process. And <laughs> yeah. as we'll talk today, academia and education are two very different things. So Today's going to be an awesome episode. Before we get into welcoming Matt and reading off his bio, just some quick updates. We are now in the month of August. And as we shared last week, we are doing a promotion in our program, Food as Medicine for the Whole Family. When you use the code back to school, you can save $100 off our program, Food as Medicine for the Whole Family. This provides over five hours of unique content as well as 100 plus hours of curated content that takes you through the entire life cycle all the way from fertility and baby led weaning to working with toddlers and getting in their protein and vegetables, encouraging children to be taste adventurers and exploring different flavors and expanding their palates, as well as learning to taste the rainbow and work with colors and phyto compounds in the spectrum of antioxidants. There is something in this program for all listeners, whether you are already a food as medicine guru or whether you're new to this concept of clean eating, we go through cleaning out your pantry, navigating the grocery store, label lingo, the importance of our macronutrients and what amounts of macronutrients are appropriate for each member of the household based on age and weight and their developmental needs. So we break down carbs, proteins, and fat, and so much more. We have a really intensive immune module, which is really timely as we're thinking of this back to school time. We hope you'll check it out. There's 20 plus handouts and worksheets that you can really customize this material to make it your own. And we know that it'll be an important tool where you'll gain tidbits of information and helpful tricks and tips to approach all members of your household and enhance their wellness. So go on over to AllieMillerRD.com and check out our food is medicine for the whole family program. Use the code back to school and that's the spelling of two. So B-A-C-K-T-O-S-E-H-O-O-L to save $100 off this program that makes this program only $99. You can use it for the lifetime of our website. We know you're going to enjoy it and you know you're going to learn a lot. And to piggyback off that, we will be doing a webinar for back to school. So it might be a good idea to have listened to at least, you know, a few of the videos before, especially those that pertain to children, like the Taste Adventure one, uh, the Immune Module before this webinar. But the webinar will be on August 17th, um, and it will cover a lot about creating the most balanced school lunch, what snacks to be sending them with, and then supporting their immune system, especially in that early kind of getting back into the gunk of yep, the fall petri with dish kids, of, right? Of, yes. <laughs> those environments. All right. Yeah. Awesome. So we hope you all will join us then as well. Um, before we get on to welcoming Matt, I want to also share that this episode is sponsored by NutriSense. 
So NutriSense provides you a continuous glucose monitor that is going to give you real-time glucose data. So 14 days of information, 24 seven. Um, this is going to ensure that you're able to watch the impact of your sleep, your stress levels, your movement or exercise, and of course your food and dietary choices on the impact of your blood sugar and your metabolism. When you purchase a CGM through NutriSense, you will also get a personalized uh, dietitian and nutritionist to support you with how to understand your data and make recommendations on how to improve your health and narrow in those areas that are outside of the ideal range. NutriSense completely takes the guesswork out from the equation because you get to see personalized responses to food, sleep, exercise, and sleep and stress, excuse me, instead of a generic recommendation. I found it extremely validating and I do every time I wear a CGM. Often stress is the star of the the show for throwing my blood sugar metabolism off, but I've even learned things like my metabolic flexibility was much, much more broad than I thought it was since I've been doing the ketogenic diet now on five plus years. I realized that my carbohydrate threshold could actually be more like 30 grams of carbs at a meal and my blood sugar won't even budge three to five points. Yet when I'm high stress and wrapping up my clinic, that epinephrine, adrenaline can cause my blood sugar to spike 40 plus points. So it's really helped me to validate the importance of using my Calm and Clear and my GABA Calm and breath work and meditation and prayer to harness the stress stallion, which was throwing off my blood sugar metabolism even more so than dietary choice. Um, so you too can be empowered by your unique information and be paired with a professional to help you to understand the data when you go on over to NutriSense.io slash AllieMillerRD. Now, when you go over to NutriSense.io slash AllieMillerRD, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you will see the opportunity to get a one-time meter use. That's $175 for a 14-day wear of a meter. Or you can also subscribe, and when you use their monthly subscription plan, you can save $30 off your first month subscription using the code AllieRD. So go on over to NutriSense.io slash Allie Miller RD and learn how you can be empowered with understanding what's going on in your blood sugar and how to really take a harness to balance whole body health. All right, I'll go ahead and read Matt's bio and then we'll bring him on the show. As a keynote speaker, consultant, and coach to organizations around the world, Matt has a reputation as a provocative thought leader in educational and personal development practices. He is a two-time featured TEDx speaker and he was named Corporate Trainer of the Year at Stanford University, having spoken to over 250,000 people across the world. In 2017, Matt Boudreau founded Acton Academy Placer, a school that uses the Socratic method with an emphasis on self-direction and cultivating confident, independent young people with a strong sense of character and personal responsibility. He has since helped to open multiple campuses around the world. Pulling from his experience in the Acton model, in January of 2021, Matt co-founded Apogee Strong with Tim Kennedy, a mentorship program designed for young men from 12 to 22 to take on challenges presented by men who have come before them in order to learn to lead. It is a rite of passage through mentorship, action, and self-discovery that young men can become true leaders. His podcast, The Essential 11, is also geared toward emerging leaders garnering advice from the world's leaders in business, sports, and entertainment. Welcome, Matt. Hello. It is a pleasure to be with you all. We are super excited to have you on today. And as we shared before we brought you on, we know that today's conversation is an important one for all listeners, regardless if they are parents or aunts or uncles or just community members, because the way that we interact with and invest our energy into growing our youth and teens is what truly shapes our country as well as the world we live in. So I know we all agree on that. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. That is absolutely true. <laughs> yes. So we have a lot to cover in today's episode. And I think as far as getting into solving problems, I want to first identify, you know, what's wrong or what the problem is. So I'd love for you to kind of open up with exploring institutionalized education, where the education took wrong education system, if you will, took wrong turns. Um, maybe some of the history on implementation of public school systems as we know it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And that's, it's an interesting 
place for people to um, start to dive down the rabbit hole. You know, compulsory schooling wasn't something that was welcomed um, with open arms in, in our country. And, and John Taylor Gatto, if you've never read anything by John, uh, he was an amazing human being, passed away a couple of years ago. I had the pleasure of meeting him before he did. And um, he's the utmost authority on, uh, on really the history behind this. So I won't do justice to the history um, and the way that he did. But, you know, the, the quick summary of it is that this was a, uh, you know, the conveyor belt schooling model that we have was something that was uh, by a Prussian design that was brought over here essentially to create factory workers. And it was essentially, you know, built to create a populace that was smart enough to follow directions on, on what they were going to be needed to do for this end result of this, this factory um, you know, sort of situation, but not really truly educated in a way where they would go, oh, okay, well, here's who I am and here's what I have to bring to the table. And here's, um, you know, potentially a better way to do this. And here's how we can innovate. And here's how there, there was no desire um, for that. And, you know, people get kind of up in arms on, oh, you know, it's, well, that sounds like conspiracy theory. Well, you know, I always ask people, why hasn't that that change, that conveyor belt model is something we are still using. And there's such good people, good teachers, good administrators. Like I love them to death. There are good humans um, within the system, but the system itself is not designed uh, to, ha to have a truly educated populace. It's designed to have a schooled population. Those are vastly different things, that's, but yeah. we're stuck there, right? As the world continues to evolve, school is not, and that's not an accident. Mm. Um, yeah, let's talk about that and kind of the difference between a systemic schooling and real education. What's the difference? So schooling has uh, taught us a number of things. It says that uh, first and foremost, we've got to put academia on a pedestal, right? And that, that academia, and I'm not against academia, but the thought that everybody doing the same academic work at the exact same time in a very narrow scope of learning, you know, uh, and pretending to learn um, this very narrow scope of all that there is to possibly explore. And that if we all do that and put that on that pedestal, that all of a sudden life is going to just churn out well for everybody. Well, that's clearly not the case. Right. And I, and, and everybody knows this um, kind of deep down, they know, they know the person that got the straight A's that then was miserable for the rest of their life and never, you know, did anything with it. They know the person that got straight D's, but had a great time right. uh, creating relationships. Right. And then they went on to be wildly successful. So, you know, those things aren't, they don't directly correlate. Um, the, and we know the, the people that were underprepared for life. And so they just kept going and kept going and kept right, going and right. got their PhD. What degree and is next? <laughs> And are just, right. just buckets of debt. Those, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? That's so funny, but it's, but it's true. Right. And if you look at all of the um, academic metrics that we want to obsessively measure in conventional conveyor belt schooling, it's hard to argue that all of those things map out to the real world. You know, and I always tell people I got straight A's all through school, all through college, all through grad school. Like I got straight A's, uh, you know, I did my trig and my calculus. I went back to show a group of parents, uh, it was about 18 months ago now, uh, I run multiple businesses and, and uh, by all intents and purposes, I'm you know, the happiest probably person that I know and got a great family and love what I get to do and all these things are, are, are great, make good money, that's fantastic. I went back there and I took a, a standardized test and my current quote unquote grade level for math is sixth grade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can run a PNL. I can run businesses that are seven and eight figures, but I, I sixth grade math, right? Because academic math doesn't uh, necessarily transfer over for most people. So that's that's one of the you know places to start. But then it gets into um, some of the more kind of sneaky, sort of underhanded things that that are detrimental to humans too. So we start talking about things like grade level, as if that was a real thing, right? Where somebody is reading at fifth grade level or eighth grade level, or the problem with that is it assumes everybody's doing the exact same thing at the same time. So what happens to that young hero who is far and above, like ready to go past whatever is there or to not just go past in an academic sense, but to 
um, really see how that concept interacts with the world. Like they want to take, it's not just, I don't just want to read harder and harder books. I want to take the concepts I've learned in those books and I want to go apply those. Well, you're not yes. allowed to because you're going too far ahead and you're not staying by the plan. Right. And then, you know, the other side of that too, is you might have a young person who is brilliant. He or she isn't, you know, maybe isn't just ready to do a certain type of academic math at some point. And we're saying, oh, you're behind. And then they start to believe at a very early age, well, something's wrong with me. Right. And so then we start to make that their inner voice. Well, I'm just dumb and something's wrong with me. And, and that's, you know, that's also a dangerous spot. Failure is not allowed. That's a dangerous mindset. Yes. Being obedient to anybody who claims authority and the loudest person wins, like that's, that's a problem. Having habits that you're, you know, built in over 12 years of, oh, I'm, I'm invested in this or I'm not invested in this, but hey, bell rings. And just like Pavlov's dog, I've got to get up and go move to something else. I got to stay in line. I got to, I got to raise my hand to, to ask another human being if I can go to the bathroom. I've got right? We do all of these things for 12 years mm -hmm. and then wonder why people come out and they don't understand how to associate into the real world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the juxtaposition of group think um, and dehumanized uh, numbering, if you will, or, or orga organized um, formation <laughs> right. of, of, of children and minds it really came to light, of course, in, in the bad season. And that was a huge juxtaposition of what happened to empowerment of critical thinking? Um, and what are we allowing in schools? If not that, is, is that not the best way to grow the brain through that autonomy and that process? Like you said, not just the memorization and regurgitation, but the process that occurs within the education. That's exactly it. And what you said there was autonomy. That is such an important part for education. Again, schooling and education are different, right? Schooling is something that is done to somebody. Education is something that they've got to grasp for themselves. And you need to be able to grab that during times of autonomy. And as much as humanly possible, you need to be given as much responsibility as you can and as much autonomy as humanly possible. Well, conventional and conveyor belt schools, they're never going to do that because they operate from the premise that you cannot trust young people. And that's so they automatically are going to eliminate the autonomy. And if you think about it, the only other system that really kind of mimics that is it's like prison, right? You just you uh -huh. can't trust, you can't trust the inmates. So what do you do? Well, you put them in, you know, a very strict schedule of, of this is your time when you get to go outside the rest of the time you're inside, you better stay in a straight line. We'll tell you when to talk. We'll tell you not when to talk. You better wear a uniform. Right. And so you start to have all of these parallels, which then creates these social hierarchies, um, because, you know, the, the, the inmates don't have voices. So they create social hierarchies in prison to give themselves power. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens in schools too, right? They don't have a voice. So they create these social hierarchies and uh, we're this group and you're that group. And if I'm older, I automatically get to look down on you. And, and if, you know, you're older, I'm going to revere you. It just, it creates a weird environment that literally plays out nowhere else good in society. <laughs> totally. And, and we start it from such an early age too, which is baffling to me. Like I was a, I was a teach for America, you know, fresh out of college, um, preschool teacher. And I got out as soon as I possibly could. Once I realized what the public education system was really about, and we're teaching these kids you know, in kindergarten to fill in the bubbles of standardized tests. I'm like, mm, no, um, but how do we start, you know, instilling that personal responsibility and autonomy and, and start to, you know, spark kids, you know, questioning things and, and spark the, who am I, what can I master? What can I solve? Yeah. I mean, that, those are, those are the key questions. And those are the things that need to start obviously at home. My contention is people don't, you know, don't send uh, your heroes, if you can help it, don't send those young heroes into a place that's going actively against that, obviously. Um, but, you know, it really starts early on with just with free play. It is so, uh, it's such a powerful concept and it's so uh, easy and so simple, but we've been trained to fear it, right? I'm going to let my kids outside in the front yard. Oh my gosh. Well, obviously they're going to be kidnapped in uh, if I see somebody outside in the front yard, then I need to call CPS on those parents, right? <laughs> humans, right. Like it's a ridiculous, my friend, uh, Lenore Skenazy does a great job with her program. 
Let Grow. If you've never read her book, uh, Raising Free Range Kids, it's it's a phenomenal read and kind of put some uh, logic back in that in that conversation. Um, but it, it you know it really starts it really starts there, and then it's you know parents that are first of all leading by you know they're leading by example, they're maintaining curiosity, they're talking about oh I wish. I want to find out this. I wish I could do this. How, how would I go about doing this? They're having those conversations in the home and, and kind of exemplifying that. And then they're giving those young people autonomy to, to go out and play and then to come back and ask questions. And you need to keep that curiosity alive. Ooh, mm. that's a great question. How, what should we do to explore that? How do we figure that out? Right. You responding with good questions is infinitely better than going, look, here's your answer. Now be quiet and let me go back to my, you know, my Instagram. Right? Yeah. It's let's talk about this together. Like you be curious along with them. Um, it, it's the best thing you can do. And then as they get older, you start adding in the responsibilities, um, you know, alongside of that. And you get a curious human being who's also disciplined enough to know that there uh, are responsibilities to take on before freedom is earned. Holy cow. You just, I mean, you just set them up to be, you know, the 1%. Um, by all stretches of the imagination. What did you say that about freedom being earned? I mean, I want to get a little bit deeper there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, my own kids, um, the heroes that I get to serve, and in, in any of the, you know, the schools that I get to work with, um, we talk about freedom. We talk about the value of freedom. We talk about the importance of freedom. We talk about the importance of sovereignty and figuring out, you know, it's self awareness and self confidence and and having sovereignty. Uh, over your own life. And, and the reality is the other side of that coin is responsibility. Yeah. Uh, want them to understand that relationship is that, you know, responsibility and freedom are two sides of the same coin and responsibility always comes first. If you'll, you're willing to take personal responsibility for yourself, for your actions, for your thoughts, for your behaviors, uh, and then you're willing to take on as much responsibility as you can, you know, uh, kind of shoulder you earn that freedom that other people just don't have. Yeah, that good. That validates. It's always that Becky and I were talking before we went live with you. Uh, her son is going to be going on two. Um, mm -hmm. And my daughter is six at this time. And so I was saying, you know, I really want to dig into that like line for my daughter, Stella. I'll say often, you know, okay, yeah, I'll be, I'll be sitting up at a restaurant. Okay. Yeah. You can go play down by the river there, yep. but, and then I set some parameters, right? Boom, ba boom, ba boom. Don't go up by the bridge where the road is X, Y, Z. And then if she crosses those boundaries, it's like, I, I use the phrase actually, unfortunately your poor choices lost that freedom to do this. <laughs> unfortunately, these poor choices did this. So that kind of validates at least how we approach it in the household, but we were talking That's about it in toddlers. Um, and I remember very, very vividly talking to my husband and being like, she is a strong woman. She's going to be <laughs> like her mama. And she's still, Becky's laughing because she still is, she is, but it's like, how do you foster that spirit, but also harness that wild stallion <laughs> when they're in that, that range of, you know, two to four, where they're just tipping that toe against the line and everything's no. And <laughs> where, where do you nurture the, the autonomy, but at that age still work to provide them parameters and boundaries? Yeah, that's such a good question. And cause you do, you want to foster that, 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 uh, you know, that drive that is so powerful and it's so um, it's so great. And the best thing I can tell parents is, you know, you want to model it again, model it first. And then you want to, you want to foster it by just having conversations around, around good decisions. People look at, you know, we've been trained. Okay. They're two, they're three, they're four. So we're going to talk to them like a baby. And we're right. Say, That's garbage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Get yeah. It. They get it. Mm -hmm. And if you will talk to them like an adult, and it doesn't mean you're going to have high level adult conversations, but it does mean you have the ability to say, look, you know, here's a good decision. Here's a bad decision. And here's why this would be a bad decision. Mm -hmm. Here's why this is a good decision. Right. And you have those conversations consistently. This is a good, this is a good decision. And you emphasize it when they make those, right. What I tell parents is, especially when you got those, um, you know, those super fiery young people, yes. <laughs> right. You're going to, the consistency is the hardest part, but you need to be consistent and you're going to correct them calmly when they miss the mark because they're going to miss the mark. And I love the way you frame that. Like, unfortunately, you know, your, your decision to do this, the, the consequence of it is this, here's why that was a bad decision. Uh, and, and here's the consequence of that. 
and you'll do better next time, right? And you're calm in that, but you need to do it every single time a bad decision is made calmly. So it reinforces that was a bad decision. More powerfully on the other side is you praise inspirationally yeah, when a yeah. good decision is made. Mm -hmm. That's more important, right? So, um, you know, I use this example. We had this really cool event uh, a couple of weeks ago, a bunch of uh, super amazing entrepreneurs. We were all together. We put on this live event. Um, and I was talking a little bit about this concept in, in my particular talk. And I gave the example, my, my son is six as well, right? So, um, you know, he was outside and playing on the ranch uh, not too long ago. And I went by in his room and, and he's got toys, you know, spread out all over the place. He knows that he's got it. He's actually got a checklist that he goes through and he knows that he takes care of his responsibilities, including cleaning up your room before he goes outside. Well, he was already outside. So, um, you know, I went out there and I said, hey, bud, come here. I said, so responsibility comes first and then you earn what? He says, freedom. I said, okay, cool. That's exactly right. Have you taken care of all your responsibilities today? Yes. Okay. So I just walked by your room. We got toys all over the place. Did you actually earn your freedom today? Ooh, no. Okay. Got it. So what do you need to do? I need to go clean my room. Yep. You need to go clean your room. And then what are we going to do, you know, for, to, to make up for this, uh, this decision? Did you, did you forget? Did you, right. So we have that conversation, but it's uh -huh. super calm. It's super yep. easy. Right. And, and then he's good. Of course he's going to mess up again. He's six. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'll have that. But same week, walking out to the ranch, we start to go through this gate. He stops and he goes, whoop, sorry about that. Ladies first. And he lets <laughs> his two older sisters and his mom go in before he does. So I swooped him up and I said, hey, I want you to look at me. That's what a good man does. You just did that because you are such a good man. Dude, I'm so proud of you. And I put him down and, and let him run. And I do that every single day time you better believe i end up having to do that a whole lot more yeah in right direction everything yeah. has a cause and effect and the effect can be praise and that's yeah. a wonderful thing yeah. <laughs> when that happens absolutely uh let's talk about in this mindset of like group think and and dumbing down or becoming this you know one directional thought process populace, or I don't even know if the word process belongs in there. Uh, let's talk about the Socratic method and um, how you use it in your educational approach and, you know, why that's a important component. Yeah, that's a really good. So it's, it's the whole thing about curiosity that we we're talking about, right? Like we want to maintain curiosity, but we also in, in, you know, the, the schools that we have and in, in, in our household, we also want to, uh, give them as much responsibility as we can and get down on their level as much as possible so that they're not looking at us as like, Hey, this just has to, this person is the ultimate authority. No, we want them to know they've got a voice too. So one of the, uh, you know, inherent things we were born with is, is that curiosity. Why, why, well, why, right. And parents all know this. Why, how come mommy, how come you do that? dad? How come this, Hey, how come that? Right. And eventually we get to the point where we're like, okay, just because I said, or just because, you know, <laughs> that's the worst possible thing we can do. Ask your father. <laughs> we just, we want to maintain that curiosity. We want to explore that. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. our approach is always to answer questions with questions. We okay. don't actually answer questions on our campuses at all. We just answer them with questions. We won't give an answer. So just, mm, that's a really good question. Why do you think that is? What should we, how can we explore that, right? Like that's the easiest way that I can explain that. We'll okay. get into more nuanced conversations where we will pose, um, you know, a higher level uh, Socratic where we'll, you know, um, so middle school students, um, we're gonna, we're in the middle of a NASA quest. We're studying space travel and rockets and space exploration. Um, so we'll show, you know, the challenger uh, from 1986 and it goes up into the air and, and it blows up. We'll show them that video. And then we show them Ronald Reagan and his national address um, to the country. And then we'll say, okay, you are now Ronald Reagan. You're going to make a choice. Do you double NASA's funding? So this never happens again, or do you completely eliminate NASA altogether? So this never happens again. 
and we'll start a conversation there giving two polar opposites. Usually the answer that people want to say is kind of somewhere in the middle, but we're going to make them think. Uh, and the best way to do that is to have to choose one extreme or another and try to defend that and have a conversation around that. And that's another example of kind of a higher level Socratic concept where we as the moderators, as the adults, just continue to probe in that way to get people to think not with any desired outcome on our side, not yeah, with, yeah. ooh, we're going to guide them to get to a specific answer because we just, that would be us telling them what to think. We want them to just understand the process of thinking. Dialogue over multiple choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And that's <laughs> what people freak out about is, well, how do you then, how do you measure that? And that's right. what we've been trained to is that you can't, you know, there's no education present if there's no, you know, tangible measurement. Well, and that's crazy. Yep. And not something that you see in the, the, you know, conventional school system no for sure. Like that doesn't happen because there's not enough time in the day because they have to get to their bubble tests and, and whatnot. Right. But how do we, you know, start to re-inspire or reawaken, I guess, a, a child who has been numbed through this, you know, systemic approach of learning, you know, quote unquote, paired with technology overload and stimulus, um, what can we do to spark their creativity or, or reignite empowerment, or maybe for the parent who can't change where they're sending their kid to school today, what can you do at home? Oh, so it's, it's so hard because what you want to be able to do is so, you know, you, you ladies are, are absolutely brilliant humans. And especially when it comes to health and wellness, right? So if somebody has spent X number of years and all they're eating is, you know, they're eating McDonald's all day, they're eating just processed garbage, like that's all they've ever eaten. And all of a sudden you're like, Hey, I'm going to take that away. Right. <laughs> How does that work? How does that go over? Right. Like there is an actual addiction to that physiologically, yes. mentally, right. They've got that addiction. Well, it's the same kind of thing that happens. You, they get addicted to the habit of outsourcing their own thought, outsourcing their thinking, like, mm. um, you know, so just like you would go, okay, look, as much as we can go cold Turkey on this and start to introduce you to these other foods that you're not even going to be super interested in for a while, you're going to maybe just kind of pick at things. Eventually you'll get hungry enough to where you're going to eat something else, right? This is the same thing as much as humanly possible. There is kind of this period of de-schooling that happens, you know, if, if a young person has been in it for a long time, if you have the ability to pull them out of that, you may need to give a little bit of a, of a time where they can kind of, um, you know, de-school to kind of get out of that mindset before curiosity starts to, uh, to rear its head again. But whether you can do that or whether you can't, you know, what I, what I tell parents is as many real world experiences as we can put in front of those young people to try to counteract, yes. um, you know, anything else that that's vital. It's one of the best, you know, really one of the best things about school that one of the only really good, well, maybe the only good thing about school, right. Is sports um, because it's an actual experience. There's a team uh, experience or maybe an individual experience where you've got to go actually do something. You've got to compete. You've got to try to, um, you know, you're, you're trying to win. Like there's valuable lessons that are learned there that help counteract this, you know, completely outsource all of my uh, thinking for whatever the teacher's rubric is, you know, of the day. So as many experiences, real world experiences that we can give those young heroes, the better. And let's talk about the, the language choice of heroes and kind of the, the, the selection of that word and what yeah. that means to you yeah. and to the children. Yeah. Um, you know, being involved with, with, uh, the Acton Academy network, you know, the, the global network, and, um, it's now just kind of ingrained. And that's what I, you know, I call my own, uh, the, the three that I get to raise, you know, those are my young heroes and, and the, the hundreds that I get to work with at my schools and the thousands I get to work with around the globe. It really, it stemmed from Joseph Campbell's work and the hero's journey. Okay. And so that's, we, you know, we look at each one of these young people as a hero who is on a hero's journey. We look at them as a genius uh, and our job is to just remain curious about them and 
keep raising their eyes to the horizon, keep their curiosity stoked. And we're all really on this journey together to try to unlock, okay, cool. What is your unique contribution to the world? You are a genius. You were designed for a specific purpose. Oh my gosh, let's be curious about what that could possibly be. And let's provide you as much um, you know, background on that, as many experiences as we can, as much responsibility as you can shoulder so that we can see what that genius is that we can then unleash on the world. And it's all based on Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. You're giving us quite the reading list. I'm, I'm taking notes. <laughs> oh, it's so good. If you haven't read it, highly, highly recommend. Okay, we'll good. do. We'll link that. We'll do. Um, shall we talk about intentional parenting a yeah, little bit? Yeah. I want to go back to that. I love, um, yeah. I saw, I think it was, I don't know if it was a podcast you had mm-hmm. done or just a soundbite on Instagram or whatnot about, you know, y'all would say that you would die for your children, but would you live for your children? Let's talk about that, you know, dichotomy, what that means and unpack that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, the way I, the way I framed it and, and, um, I was very grateful that I, I mean, I think a lot of people, it at least got a lot of good conversations going. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the way I framed it was, you know, would you die? And it, it stemmed from a conversation I had with a bunch of dads and I said, you know, somebody says, I would die for my kid. I said, you know what? I, I'm sure you would die for your kid. I know you would. How many of you dads would die for your kid? Every hand. Mm-hmm. Right? every single one. And I'm like, absolutely, man, I would die for mine too. But what I told him was you'd only have to die once though. You would make that one noble sacrifice <laughs> to protect that young hero one time. And, and there you go, right? It's way harder to wake up every single day and choose to be intentional about paying attention to who each one of your kids is and parenting him or her accordingly. It's to be intentional about the way you lead your own life, getting yourself healthy, making sure you're on a hero's journey and leading by example. Because if you're telling them they should be on this journey and they can do everything, but then they hear you complaining about your job, complaining about your health, right. complaining about, right? Well, they pick up that hypocrisy and then well, why am I going to believe anything you're saying, right? So it's way harder to spend every day being as intentional as you can about your own life and about, you know, raising uh, those young heroes the way they need to. Uh, That's the most noble decision. Yeah. And, and harder in the sense, like, it sounds like it takes more time. It takes a lot more patience, like the way you were talking about, you know, framing. Yep. Yep. And, and you wake up and do it every day. (laughs) I talk about that often in women's circles about this idea of like surviving the day. Right. (laughs) And this perspective shift that really needs to occur of, you know, I I do remember very vividly when I was still working my clinic full time after that nighttime breastfeed, when I would put my daughter in the swaddle when she was still a baby. And there was just this like chemical surge of like, you did it. (laughs) You swaddled that baby and you're putting her down and you're done. You get to clock out for the day. Um, But, you know, as I've evolved as a mother and I really work through this idea of like, okay, why am I counting the hours to survive her through her bedtime? I should be revamping this and find gratitude and grace and connection and moment and this humbling experience of this human that I get to be a part of growing and nurturing and this is, this is it. Like these are the moments actually, Mm -hmm. not those moments after when you numb out and you get your hour of, you know, doing the laundry or whatever. These are the moments that you don't want to be distracted with your phone. You don't want to be distracted with gossip in the neighborhood or anything else. You want to be present. And I love that, like being alive for them and, and seeing that thrive desire component. So good. There's a reason we look back, right? You look back at those pictures and the videos of, you know, and you're looking at Stella when she was two and you're like, oh my gosh, so I can, you can look at Stella right now at six and go, she is awesome. This is amazing. And I love this human. And then you also can simultaneously look at a video of her at two and go, but I also miss Mm -hmm. that human so much, right? And every parent can relate to that. There's a reason we look back and, and we just go, oh my gosh. And that's, you know, the one thing I urge parents is it's exactly what you just said, like be in the moment, be present right there and enjoy it as much as you can, as hard as I know it definitely is and can be, um, because you will look back and go, oh my gosh, I wish I could just do that one more time, you know, because it is so powerful. And moms are, uh, the superheroes of the planet period (laughs) story. Um, every other job is to support that job. Um, 
you know, and I know it's exhausting. And my, you know, again, my wife, best mom I've ever seen in the history of the world. Um, but man, as much as you can switch that mindset to enjoy it, dear God, please do. I think a lot of societal norms and like destructuring this idea of a family and, and a mother being a worthy job uh, plays a huge role in that as right. well. And we're starting to see, I think we're on this crux right now of, again, over-educating, overworking, under-living. Um, and, and we're all kind of starting to bloom and say, okay, well, this is not what I was told. This is not what I was sold <laughs> that I have to do this full-time gig and raise these humans. Um, and I think that that's a huge realization and yeah. aha moment as well. I'd, I'd love to hear about your um, Boudreaux family rules. Um, there was some mention of those and I want to I know what they are so we can all be inspired. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, I should have gotten, let me get the picture out. I should have these memorized. I mean, they're literally in our living room and, uh, and we go through those all the time. If I'm honest, my kids hold me to them more than I hold them. And so that's the whole concept, right? Is we put together a... Uh, a contract. So mm -hmm. it was essentially just, Hey, who do we want to be as a family? Like if somebody thinks of our family, what are the things they should be able to consistently say about us? Who do we want to be every day? And what choices do we want to make around that? Right. And so we put together kind of a list and it means I added some and my wife added some, you know, we threw some things on the table. Um, all my kids got to, got to pour into what they wanted that to be. And we came up with um, what we thought our top 11 would be. And so the cool thing there is we continuously revisit those, but we all have the ability to call each other on it as well. So that means, you know, uh, my kids are fighting. And if I go, Hey, look, Number four is to be the, you know, the nicest person in the room, right? Are you guys doing that right now? We can, we all signed that. We all signed that contract right. and said we wanted to do it, right? So I can hold them to that. But the cooler thing is when my kids go, hey, dad, um, man, rule number six is no complaining, fix it. You, you kind of sound like you're complaining about that problem right now. <laughs> right? What's your solution? And that is where as a parent, yeah. You got to get out of your ego where you're like, no, I'm the parent. I'll complain if I want. <laughs> right. Like you just lost all credibility yep. at that point. So you've got to let them, um, you've got to let them have that ownership too. So um, gosh, I'm looking for it. So, and I'm looking for the picture of it. I should have had that ready to go and prepare, but it's like, so let's see, be, being honest, um, starting with yourself is uh, the first one being the nicest person uh, in the room, being the hardest worker in the room, discipline equals freedom. Uh, you are always personally responsible. Memento Mori, um, doing the right thing is always the right thing. No complaining, fix it. Uh, think because most people won't. Love that. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, gosh. Those are the ones I can think of. How, how old were your children when you came up with them together? Um, this was five, five, right about five years ago. So okay, okay. six, yeah, it was right about five years. So yeah, six, four, six, four and one, the one year old, okay. obviously didn't, he didn't get any, he didn't get any say. No, <laughs> but, um, but the other ones, but the other ones did. you know, the girls, the other, the girls did. I love the no complaining, fix it. And um, I'm thinking of one of mine that I say to Stella all the time of, well, if you're bored, that sounds like your problem. The only people that I know that are bored are boring people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> My uncle used rude. to say that to me. Rude, yep. but yes. <laughs> so I was like, figure it out, yep. girlfriend. Yep. That's, yep. Oh my gosh. So always something to look at and imagine. And <laughs> yep. Totally. Yeah. You can't be, yeah. We always, we tell them like, you can't be, you can't be bored. Yes. And at this point they'll just repeat it. You right. can only be boring. Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 That was, that was one of ours. We were instilled with too. Um, I want to ask about, um, raising boys, um, because you mentioned your son and, um, kind of that, you know, chivalry instilled with ladies first and, and, you know, I, I have a boy and I have a girl on the way. And so I'm going to have one of each. Um, and it's a hard time to raise boys, I think, like where, where's the line between, you know, you want to instill masculinity and, and responsibility in them and responsibility for the family. Uh, but you also want them to be, you know, gentle and kind. Um, where do you, where do you start there? 
Yeah, that's so I, you know, I get the distinct honor of working with young men in, in our mentorship program, too. And so um, what we talk about is, is what masculinity really is and what it is supposed to be. You know, it's our belief that it is this um, kind of classic set of values, right? It's an honorable set of values. We don't believe in toxic masculinity. Yeah, you can be toxic, but if you're toxic, it's not masculine. Right. That's that's not what that is. That's dangerous and that's weak. Um, it's not OK to be that because a good man has those values instilled so that he can ride what we say are, are kinds of the, the uh, kind of the dichotomy uh, of being a good man. You want to be able to be the savage and the gentleman and, and you're going to operate the majority of the time in that gentleman mode. Right. And so we want our young men to be fully capable. And when I say capable, I mean capable as far as you've got a wide skill set. You're capable of, um, you know, you're physically capable. You're capable to save your own life physically. You're capable to defend somebody physically if you have to. You're capable to be able to use weapons. You're capable. Like, that's great. But you're not going to have to do that most of the time. You want to be able to do that in case you have to. But you want to spend the rest of your time in service to other people. You want to spend the rest of your time being the leader who leads by examples and, and, and by example, and you don't want to, you know, have a bunch of people following you. No, you want to build up other leaders. Like that's what good men do. They go serve and they inspire other people to be leaders as well. And that's what, you know, that's what we need to do. So, um, you know, for that young, for that young man of yours, those are the conversations we have. And to be honest, you know, again, moms are the superheroes bar none. But young men need good male mentors as much yes. as possible, preferably the father, right? And that's just, um, that's statistically true. That's not, you know, my emotional cry for anything else. And, and I know people get upset sometimes when I say that. It's statistically true. And I understand some people don't have the father in the home. And, I, and I'm so sorry about that. And I still believe that that young man then needs good male mentors, whether it's an uncle, whether it's yeah. a brother, whether it's, you know, the, a coach finding other good male mentors, um, because, you know, uh, young men, they, they will take that advice from good men who are leading by example. They'll take it more than, you know, or sooner, I would say, than they would from, from, uh, from mom. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think also carrying how dad treats mom, the oh innate, you know, most imprinted positioning of how a boy learns to be a good man, you know, that, that positioning of how we treat women and that connection, how they communicate, um, I think is a huge piece too. Yeah. For sure. And it's how dad treats everybody, right? Yes, it's, for it's sure. Watching dad, it's dad treating mom is the example of this is how I'm supposed to treat women. Dad, uh, you know, talking to his friends is the example of how I act with my friends, dad out in the community. Is he caring for people? Is he willing to help somebody? Is he helping a stranger? Is he continuously saying, you know, does he have those manners? Yes, ma'am. And no, ma'am. And yes, like, is he doing that? Because if this is what he's doing on a day to day, that is my example of what a man does, right? And you start that early and dads, when they're leading by example, especially for, it goes this way for their daughters as well, but it's especially for their young men as we're, as their young men are developing that inner voice, that inner voice that they're, you know, when they have conversations with themselves, whether they're by themselves or with other people and they're inside their own head, that voice starts out as dad's yeah. voice. Yeah, no doubt. That's uh, dad. And how about when we're talking about emotions? Cause I'm thinking of, you know, like dad at the soccer field, dad, <laughs> all the different positions of, of that. But, but I'm honestly wanting to lean this a little bit more into where we're at today in society, especially in the U S with group think and the idea that there is such it to me in, in my recollection of the 38, almost years I've been on this earth, it feels like volatility and anger and, um, aggression of, of individuals that have a position against the narrative that there's this just volatility of like crying and blah, blah, blah. there's just so much emotion. Why do you think that that is? Do you think that, that you know, I'm, I'm just going to open it there and just see what you say. Yeah. There's a lot of broken individuals. So emotions are great. Emotions are a great thing. Um, we need to learn what those are and, and but we need to stop being uh, always controlled by them and rewarded for who has them loudest ones, right? Like it's a, you know, so we've got this victimhood 
mentality that's being perpetuated and yes. it's a multifaceted issue. Oh, uh, so, yeah. You know, culture obviously perpetuates it. The media helps perpetuate it. Those things are non, uh, you know, you, you can't argue against that, but then there's all these subtleties of, well, school, school helps perpetuate it as well, right? You get to be a victim at school. You start to, again, dumb down the thinking and, and emotions always win. And so school's a part of it. Parenting trends are a part of it. Um, you know, all of those things are playing into this rise in this, like you said, it's an angry and, and aggressive, um, in a very sad group and they uh, get the spotlight far too often where, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're the ones we're seeing the most and hearing the most. And it's, and it's unfortunate and we got to make sure our young people aren't, uh, attracted to that by any sense of the imagination to think that that is going to be somehow, uh, something that makes them victorious in anything they do. It's a death sentence. Yeah, right. In some sense, I wonder if it's just that lack of exposure to discourse or critical thinking yeah. or, you know, healthy debate and yeah. and honoring individuals' unique perspectives. And, and again, re we've never gotten it. When I brought this all back to medicine in the, you know, in the bad season, it's always like, we never did anything in the medical field without questioning the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Like that is how you, you move science as a field forward. So when you can't question the hypothesis, we're at a really scary time when it's just, you have to trust the science that is in itself a toxic language connection of trust the science. The science should always be questioned. Um, and so I think that that's a component, but then also I wonder if this like hyper categorizing and, and labeling. And like you said, creating victims by subset, like this breaking down and deconstructioning and telling individuals that they have to fit in these very unique pigeonholed subsets. Yes. Um, I don't know if that's a piece of it as well. And if you think oh, that that's sure. perpetuated by schooling. For sure it is. Yeah. The, the, you know, um, that consistent labeling is a, is a giant issue. The schooling also perpetuates, you know, you don't get to gain any self-awareness because everybody has to be the exact same, same time. And so you're looking for the, a way to, how do I differentiate myself from what everybody's doing at the same time? I only get to hang out with people of my same date of manufacture. So how do yeah. I differentiate? Right. So, um, you know, I, I can differentiate by creating this category over here that I'll just identify with. Right. And it's, it's a weird game of trying to, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do what we're designed to do is have these experiences so that you can actually figure out who you are. Right. The problem is you're not, you know, the, the self-awareness and the self-confidence comes from actually doing, Yeah, They've not just talking about it, like doing things and trying things and failing and yeah. trying again, you know, like that, that's where it is. And, and one of the, gosh, man, one of the sneaky, um, again, kind of cultural issues um, everybody worries about cell phones as they should. I get it for young people and cell phones and what they're exposed to and how early and some people are giving, you know, their kids phones at mega early ages. And, you know, it starts to build some of these cultural issues into them very early on. Yes, we should be worried about that, but gosh, we also medicate our kids super freaking mm -hmm. quick, yep. especially our young boys, right? It's like, let's get them on speed. Right. Like six, your kid does not have a meth deficiency at six. I promise. Yep. Allie so, says that all the time. Yep. Oh my I think I said that on your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's where I got it. Yeah, okay. where I got it. No child favorite. has a clinical deficiency for methamphetamine. Yeah, I will go on record. I, yeah. I, dude, I've owned that since you said that. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, perfect way to describe it. It is the perfect way to describe it. So, um, you know, those are huge and video games are a huge yes. thing mm. you as well. Um, oh, it's like, yeah. um, this, um, when I think of, again, these teens, it's like, they're, they're so hungry to be unique, but they've become so numbed with the ability to critically think or understand what unique even is that they just go in these subset standardized categories, which they think are out of the norm culture. It's like that South park, um, episode where Cartman's like, I'm such a nonconformist that I'm just going to conform. <laughs> it's like, it's like, so sad to watch because that's what I see happening. You know, like right. green hair. Well, I have green hair. Well, I have green hair, you know, kind of thing, or, you know, what's my pronoun this week or what's the, there's, there's such this standardized societal quote unquote, because they can't think for themselves. So there's no uniqueness. They have to, they have to subscribe to a unique subset pod. That's right. And they're too scared to go figure out who they are because they've right. been taught failure is, is a bad thing. And yeah, inevitably, if you're going to get good at something, you're going to have to start out sucking at it. And that just, you know, 
the the prospect of that altogether is just horrifying for for too many people. Sure. Uh, but it's a scary thing. And that's where video games like ends up being super sneaky is because these young, especially our young men, like we're yeah. designed to go want to conquer and we want to go adrenaline. create. Yes. We want to go on an adventure. We want to go, you know, we want to push through something. We want to push through boundaries. We want to battle. We want to fight. Well, all of that gets checked off playing these video games. Mm. And so then when the real world comes about, that doesn't seem as exciting. Well, my impetus to want to go conquer something and create and to go lead and to go, you know, have this adventure. Well, gosh, I can just go sit down in my living room, man. I can do that for 12 hours straight and you know, I'm all set. And and that's a, uh, that's a rough place. Man. You've atrophied. It's like right. how porn robs healthy sexuality. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You were right. So parents are up against a lot. It sounds like, right. <laughs> um, what would you say? Maybe some of the, the biggest issues that you see most parents struggling with today and, and your solutions for if you have them yeah um i mean the biggest you know i i have the very distinct honor of talking to parents all day every day um and you know really there are so many people living in fear there's so many of them that have been injured you know, emotionally um you know psychologically by a lot of these same things they grew up going to the same kind of schools and all this so they just they're so afraid of um, making a wrong decision. They're paralyzed into making any decision. So what do they do? They just turn around and do the same thing that was done to them. Right. And so, um, you know, getting, getting parents out of the fear-based mentality, I always try to get to the root of, well, what are you afraid of? Yeah. Um, are you afraid of, of success in your own life? Or are you afraid of, um, you know, your mom or your friend is going to think you're a bad parent. If you homeschool your child, you really want to homeschool and you think it's the best thing for them, but um, gosh, you know, Sally next door will think I'm a bad parent. And if I don't have that Harvard parent bumper sticker <laughs> on the back of my car to show everybody I was a good parent, then what am I doing? Right. So it's usually, it's a fear-based thing. A lot of times based on, you know, fear of somebody else's opinion. So I want to get people out of that um, and getting out of the uh, religion of conveyor belt schooling, uh, is a huge problem. And, and I know it sounds like I'm saying that because I'm in education. And so well, 90 plus percent of our population goes through a conveyor belt school program for mm -hmm. 12, 13 years, at least of his or her life by all intents and purposes, it is like the biggest monopoly we've got going in this country. And it's not uh, non-coincidental that it's, we got everybody going through here, you know, this, this system and, and coming out incapable of civil discourse and critical thinking. And, um, so getting out of fear and getting out of conveyor belt, um, two of the biggest, two of the biggest things that can be fixed right now. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk, um, a little bit on your school, um, the Acton Academy Placer it opened in 2017, and um, where are the campuses? What's the mission? And give us a little bit of a breakdown there. I know you kind of alluded to it, but I love yeah, an so overhaul. We've got, uh, so we have multiple campuses around the world. This is really a network of entrepreneurs who, I mean, are subscribing to kind of rule number six in our household, right? Don't complain, fix it. Like we don't like conveyor belt schooling. Cool. Well, let's build something that's better. Um, and that's really what this is. And so, you know, I don't even... Um, I don't even operate day to day uh, for the three campuses that I founded in, in the Sacramento area right now. What I do is I help uh, the 300 entrepreneurs globally just from an entrepreneurial standpoint, like how to run more uh, efficiently. And I help recruit new um, owners. And it's if other entrepreneurs are going, man, we could use something like this in our uh, in our area, then I help bring them in because it's a network of people who are um, building campuses where young heroes take the reins. They take on the responsibility of, of their own education. They get to tackle real world problems, real world um, projects, both from an individual level as well as a collaborative level. Um, they take on so much responsibility. I'm talking like my chef uh, on one of my campuses. He's a young man. He's a student and he's the chef on campus, cooking real food every single day. He went down to a Weston A. Price training. He's making real food. He hires awesome. other young people to come in and they cook food for everybody else on campus. That's a, I mean, that's massive responsibility early, right? And so they take on 
um, jobs on campus, jobs off campus, apprenticeships, internships, all to build those things we were talking about earlier, self-awareness and, and self-confidence. And the beauty of the network is, you know, if we create um, kind of a quest or a big pro collaborative project and we go, oh, this is really cool. And the heroes are like, yes, we like this. And we're going to do this way. And we're going to do it this way. And we're going to modify this. We'll record all of it um, and send it out to everybody else and go, hey, if you guys want to try this, go for it. If you don't, that's fine too. So it's really this network of awesome human beings who believe in the genius of young people. And uh, we just help each other help the young heroes. And do you have a campus in Texas? Because I'm going to have to sign my son up. <laughs> got a bunch of, that's actually our most populated state. I was okay. going to say Austin. I know there's yeah. a yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell us where yeah. they are in, in Texas. Because we have, of course, a lot of Texas listeners, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Houston. Yep. All the areas you just mentioned. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Most, most prominent in the Austin area. I think we have, gosh, I want to say like 13 or 14, wow. just okay. in the greater Austin area alone, but we've got a handful in, in Dallas. I think we've got one or two right now, San Antonio. We've got uh, a couple in Houston uh, and I know like the Woodlands area. I don't know the geography, yeah. Super yeah. Well, but I know the Woodlands area. Mm -hmm. um, so we're in almost every state. And the beauty of this is if you've got, you know, entrepreneurial, uh, kind of spirit. And you're like, look, man, there is nothing around my area. Um, man, glad to help you. And there's no, no benefit on, on my side for that other than just helping young people, man. I'm glad to help you figure out what it looks like to launch one out there. And what ages do you serve? So there's sovereignty for each owner uh, on the way they want to do it. And, you know, the campuses okay. that I started are all K through 12. Okay. Um, but sovereignty of the owner. So some just want to do, you know, they, start elementary, almost, almost everybody starts elementary. And then some want to grow up through middle school and high school. And some want to just kind of go, you know, through middle school, it's sovereignty of the owner. Okay. So we'll, we'll list, um, Acton Academy and, and, um, all of the places to find those in our, our show notes for today. Um, we're also big fans of, of Tim Kennedy, and we'd love to hear what, um, you guys share in your online program, Apogee and, and the mentorship that you've talked about a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Tim is a, is a great guy and a dear friend. And, um, you know, this was just, this was us sitting down. We were actually talking about these schools and I helped him open one of the Acton Academies out, out where he is in Cedar park. And, um, you know, we're kind of talking about this thing and going, man, we, we're just kind of lamenting about all of the good men that we have in our various networks. And, and many of those guys were, you know, friends in common. And, um, we were talking about this need for young men to have good male mentors speaking in their lives and developing that inner voice. And we're like, man, let's, why don't we put these guys in front of, you know, as many young guys as we can. So we put together this program that, uh, brings young men together from, from all over the world. Uh, they commit to, to 12 months of being the best possible versions of themselves. So every month, um, the young men get uh, a new reading to take on. They get a new series of workouts that we put together to take on. They get a new project to take on and a new challenge. And so every 30 days they've got those. And then every week they jump on uh, with myself, Tim, or both of us. Uh, and we will bring in another male mentor. And these guys might be you know, former Navy SEALs or famous actors or famous musician or comedian awesome. or, you know, professional athlete. Um, the prerequisite is that they're a good man doing good things. Um, and they come in and just pour into our young guys and the young guys get to chat directly with them and ask questions about anything they want, life in general, right? And just got good people pouring into these guys uh, every single week. And then some of them, as they graduate, they hold like accountability calls during the week. So I've got, you know, four or five different days during the week where you've got 16 year old, 17 year old young men who host a zoom meeting for other young men who are still in the program. And they just encourage them and go, man, well, here's how I did that challenge. Here's how I took on that project. Here's how I would have done it different. Right. And so it's just perpetuating, um, good men building up strong young men. Uh, and it's fantastic. 
Love it. Oh, that sounds so good. And that leadership connection could even be done as, you know, parents listening are transitioning their children from a school system and finding or seeking or creating a pod. <laughs> and so there's things that you can layer in. And then of course, the conscious parenting and language choice in the household and modeling can be done immediately. I mean, it's a learning curve for all of us, but can start right away. Um, I just want to share before we let you go about the essential 11. Um, if you can kind of share what you do on your podcast if people want to hear your voice more i'm sure they will and then where they can connect with you on social channels oh so awesome man thank you very much um yeah the essential 11 was born out of the you know all of this is is kind of the same mission and so um we actually went to a focus group uh, a couple of years ago it was 1500 young people from across the country ages 13 to 22 and we said hey what are the questions you would want to have from people who are leaders in society um, it was kind of a tribe of mentors, you know, sort of thing. And so we cultivated their top questions and we use that as the framework uh, to speak to some really, really cool people. Ali obviously included um, was, I think it was probably over a year ago at this point, but yeah, yeah, um, you know, but it, it was phenomenal. So we just go to really, really amazing humans um, who are impacting the world in positive ways. And we, we use those questions uh, again, as just kind of the, the basis of the conversation. And even more recently too, what we've done is, um, some of my Apogee calls where I've got the young men on, you know, with us, we'll actually release those as episodes as well. So you can kind of even hear the format where it's like, I'll go, you know, we just, who, last week we had uh, my friend Will Witt and we had Joe DeSena who started, um, you know, Spartan races and, and all that. So we had those guys were on last week and you can hear, like, I'll chat with those guys for 20, 30 minutes and then we'll open up the floor and some of these young guys will jump in and they'll ask questions too and too. And it just, it's really fun format. And um, I think super informative to young heroes, but parents as well. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, I stay active on primarily on Instagram, uh, just, just at my name uh, and always glad to, uh, to help any way that I can. So people, you know, message and DM and it might take me a couple of days, but I try to get back to every single person if I can help uh, especially, you know, parents and, and educators, and I'm always glad to do so. All right. So we'll include all of that info in our show notes for listeners. So they know exactly where to find you. Um, I'll make sure we link the episode you did with Allie in case they want to go back and listen to yeah, that one sure. in the archive. Um, this has been such a fun conversation. Any like last words of wisdom to leave us with? You know, uh, it goes back to kind of what we were talking about with some of the bigger issues. If parents I just encourage you to not live in fear. Um, you know, there's a million ways to, to raise a human being um, and you can do it and, and uh, enjoy the heck out of it at the same time. And so um, I just encourage people to get out of that, you know, fear, really audit their young humans that they get to the privilege of raising and enjoy every dang moment of it. Love it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you both. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.